to quickly do some introductions of who we've got here today. Your facilitator today is going to be Nick Arnim. He's from Transition Town Brixton uh, and the What Next Summit team. Uh, and we've got presentations today from Debbie Bourne and Habiba Nab, who are from Transition Kentish Town and, and the awesome Camden Think and Do project. Uh, and we have also Catherine Ross from Sustainable St Albans and um, she is also from their amazing sustainability festival. So uh, I think that could be all the introductions and things that I need to say. Dan, do loop in if there's something very important I've forgotten to say before we kick off. No. In that case, I'm going to hand you into the safe hands of our facilitator for today, Nick Arnim. Okay, um, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we appreciate the time of day it is, and so it's quite difficult for people to join at this particular time, but we really are grateful for, for your presence, and we're looking forward to sort of interacting with you after the presentations as well. So please do listen carefully and have, have questions ready for, for our presenters. Okay, so... Um, the, the, the invitation or the provocation here within this talk is um, reaching out beyond our, the usual suspects. I want to situate that idea within the um, within within ideas of community. So um, community is, is is a very simple word or deceptively simple word and concept. Yet it's so complex um, in terms of the social phenomenon that um, challenges our approach to understanding and also evaluating what's going on. Um, it's a polysemic word, you know, it has many, many meanings to different people. And it's, uh, I often describe the word community as quite promiscuous because um, lots of people use it, but especially um, um, government officials, you know, be they at the local level or at the national level, they always try to um, use community in order to try to get buy-in into certain projects that, that they're doing. And uh, they often abuse this notion of community. What we have um, today with our presenters are two examples of how, um, how to do work within the community and how to reach beyond um, people that are within our normal sort of inner circle, so to speak, our in-groups, you know, how can we reach beyond um, our in-groups to other, other groups? Because if we are to um, face, face um, all the challenges that we have, if we are to address all the challenges that we have, then we're, we're going to have to try to work together, you know, Yes, we might have different interests, but oftentimes those interests are interconnected in one way or, or another. So on that note, um, again, keep, keeping in mind that we want to try and we've discussed this and we want to try and um, open the floor for as many questions as possible because we know that everyone that has come here is interested in working in communities in some, in some respect and is interested in broadening the circle, the, the, the circle of we within, within communities. I shall now pass on to um, the lovely team from, from Kentish Town. Um, and that's Debbie and Habibi, and they're going to talk um, for about 15 minutes um, about projects they've been involved in and also how they've, they've succeeded and probably crucially some of the challenges, they've, uh, some of the most common challenges they've come across whilst trying to work beyond the usual suspects. Over to you, Debbie and Habibi. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, we're Debbie and Habibi, as you said, from Transition Kentish Town. Um, uh, we just want to tell you a little bit about some of the adventures we've embarked upon upon the last couple of years. Um, we've had a lot of fun, it's been a lot of work, um, and we think we're starting, you know, to make some difference in our community. Very briefly, Transition Kentish Town started off sort of about 10 years ago. Um, we started to do the usual things that I guess a lot of you guys are doing, movie nights, um, you know, other 
the usual events we were doing. We realized we were sort of talking to ourselves. We were excited and we had 30 or 40 people in a room, but we thought we need to start reaching out to other people. So we started to do gardens like health centers. We started to work with schools and we were bumbling on nicely. But then in 2019, Camden declared a, a climate ecological emergency. They convened a citizens assembly and this whole thing about mobilizing community and doing co-design with the community came about. And then we were called into a meeting with the council saying, right, we're giving you our shop in the high street for six weeks. It's going to be called Think and Do, and we're going to co-design it with the council and the community. As you can see from this slide here, we had a lot of fun. Suddenly, lots of council departments were involved. Lots of different community groups came together. We ran workshops. We shared skills. We shared food. We drank. Um, and what was really good about our Think and Do project was that it brought all the different community groups in the borough together. So instead of us being Transition and Friends of the Earth there and Greenpeace and XR, we all became one eco family. Also, what was great about it is all the different council departments started to get involved. As projects came, as people came up with ideas for projects, we had to reach out to different council departments. They got involved, different council officers. The ecosystem was growing. Um, next slide, please. Um, thank you. Um, here's some quotes and sort of what happened. But what I want to tell you all is I want to encourage you all to set up your own think and do's. And I think actually a better name might be call it what ifs. Let's have a load of what if shops. But you know, it doesn't have to be a shop in the high street. It can be a day in your local community centre, your local mosque, your local doctor's surgery. It could be a weekly event. Um, housing estates is something I'm going to talk about in a minute. You know, we urge you all to set up your own pop ups and we, we're here to help. I'm happy to share email addresses at anyone that needs some support in doing that. And we are going to create a toolkit for how to create your own so you don't have to recreate the will. Um, COVID came, um, we went to webinars, we did pretty well. And then last summer we had the idea, you know, when, when we saw COVID was gonna increase, we were gonna be in more lockdowns, more mutations. I flicked through Rob's book one day and it came across the kind of, what about if we created a newspaper for the future? So we thought, what if we could approach our local newspaper, the Camden New Journal, and get them to publish a four page community wraparound written by the community and it might come out, might be published on January the 7th this year, 2021. But this wraparound was with, written from the year 2030, written from the future, once we've addressed, started to address the climate action and social inequality. So I approached the CNJ, they thought it was a good idea. I then called Habiba, she thought it was a good idea. Habiba and I convened the bigger transition and the other groups in the area. And we got going on the project. Um, next slide, please. But we wanted to make sure that this project spoke to a lot of people in the community, that when people opened up their newspaper, it spoke to everyone. It wasn't just our sort of transition messages. Um, so over to you, Habiba, now to talk about that. Um, so some of the, the idea was really to go beyond this, uh, beyond just what we might see as climate. I think broadly within our group, we accept that climate, um, the climate crisis is a symptom of what quality, what is going on in terms of the economy. So we wanted it to be a, a broad um, yeah, call out for all of that, reimagining all of that. So some of the questions we put out were really um, an example, inviting people to, to, to think about that. And so we set up an editorial panel. We, we, we didn't know, we called it that. We didn't have any other name, but we just thought, okay, who's gonna choose? Uh, we thought that, okay, if we're gonna, we, if we, we get 50 articles, um, we need to maybe choose 20, how are we gonna do that? And uh, we, we put a panel together. And again, we really wanted to reach beyond um, the people that we normally work with. So we reached out to people who work in arts broadly, um, local residents who work with businesses, um, reached out with um, people who work in schools. So we're really trying to, to really go beyond the people we normally work with. And we had to go with people we have relationships with because you know it's difficult to approach people you don't know. And as Debbie said, we spent the last three years really thinking about building a, a broader coalition and broader relationships with people um, in our community. And not just those who are working on what we might call climate but also those who are working on what we might broadly say are social issues. Um, so yeah, so we reached out to them 
And uh, yeah, we, we were very glad that, you know, they enthusiastically responded. We wanted a relatively small group of probably about 10 because then you've got enough diversity, um, to, but it's not a big group to slow things down. Um, and we did a lot of the admin because, you know, you're going to have to do a bit of admin to help people so that you, they don't get bogged down with all that kind of the boring stuff. Um, we took that on um, and then we, we set up, I think, initially two meetings, but we're all we've never done this before. So we realized that, oh God, because of the deadlines, we can only actually have one meeting, yeah. Um, but um, in that meeting, we really respected what it is people chose. You know, we said, you know, you're, you're, we, 10 of us are gonna choose what those articles are gonna be, the entries. We had over 300 entrances, so we weren't expecting that. Again, we thought initially, oh, we get about 50, if anything, and we had 300. So we had to work through all of that. Um, and again, how we tried to have that meeting, uh, the panel meeting, um, I was chairing it, but again, we chaired it the two of us, but we're trying to really, other than it being some, some, something that's quite combative because some of our meetings can be like that. Um, and yes, and then that's what we ended up with. I think next slide. Yeah. So you can see this is what we ended up with. So um, just to say, once we chose the articles, there was another group of people who are really going to look at sort of um, the this, this spelling and sort of um, editing things down a bit and then putting it together. Camden New Journal was very generous in sort of um, um, giving us one of their editors to work with us to put it together. Um, and this is what we come up with. As you can see, it's a whole range of really interesting things because if it was just our group, we probably wouldn't have come up with um, you know, some of these ideas. Um, and because we had young people as well, they kind of, they did, they did poetry and um, they did kind of uh, drawings and things like that. Again, if it was just us, a bunch of sort of uh, uh, um, uh, people in our forties uh, and fifties, we would not have been able to come up with, with this sort of range of ideas. Um, and Debbie, do you want to add anything about this? So basically, when the when the journal came out in January, we were amazed. Um, the County New Journal had turned into a whole green issue. Next slide, please. But basically, we're not going to talk much more about this now, but we were, we're so happy to talk to any of you out there after us about how to set up your own visioning wherever you are around the country. It's a lot of work, but great fun, but it really worked. We reached 60,000 people with this, and the CNJ are now doing green issues in every week of their issue. Could we have the next slide, please? Um, that's just, you know, in the newspaper, when we opened it up that day, we couldn't believe they turned the whole issue green. But then we thought, what next? So we've published a four page wraparound written by the community, what next? So we formed a group, two groups, a, roll, a Visioning Camden rollout group. And this group is exploring having an exhibition to tour the borough, a roving exhibition. We had the Camden People's Theatre say, hey, we want to do a play. We've had people saying, we want to publish a book. The CNJ said they want it to be a book. We've had teachers at school saying, we want to design a year seven um, learning webinar. It's been great. We've also formed a project group, which is a, a harder job. How do we bring some of these um, projects to life? Um, um, so, you know, where do we go from here? So these two groups are ongoing. When we thought, well, hang on a minute, what next? We're coming out of COVID now, hopefully. We've had our wrap, we've got our groups. And then we thought, well, that's, now it's time to go back to think and do, to get some pop-ups going. How do we continue this reaching beyond the usual suspects? Council have suddenly got very excited about all the work they're doing. We're doing, they're gonna fund some touring exhibitions and Camden Council have got something called the Renewal Commission. One of the remits of the Renewal Commission is to create vibrant estates. So we're now started, we decided, what if we could have our Vision in Camden exhibition touring um, TRA halls around the borough? What if we could do a pilot? So we're working with one estate in Somers Town with the residents to arrange a two week pop up in the summer, which has been partly financed by Transition Bounce Forward money. We, our vision is to take over a TRA hall. We're working with new groups now like Refugee Community Kitchen since the wrap. They're gonna set up a lunch service using waste food. Um, they're gonna set up a radical tea room because you know, if you set up your own pop-ups the main rule is tea, a cup of tea has got to be free 
Um, so we're going to do pop-ups at estates, we're going to create toolkits, we've been doing things like handing out trees to people on housing estates in pots to put in balconies and walkways as residents that live on concrete estates that don't have access to green space. And what I, I just want to finish by telling you before I hand back to Habiba is Habiba and Nick, you know, we, we're all in agreement that basically our climate action work very much links with social action now. It's the same story. We need to view it through the same lens. And I can sum this up by a conversation I had yesterday with a resident on the Osselton estate in Somers Town, a guy called Rienzi, who's a full-time carer for his mum who has dementia. And we were talking about this pop-up and workshops. And he said, you know, could we have some weaving? My mum loves tactile things. When we had, we do something like weaving or sewing, it helps bring back our memory. And it was just a beautiful moment. I was like, absolutely, Rianti, this is exactly the kind of thing we should be doing. Someone came in and said, could we set up a toy swap shelf? I don't have money to buy my kids toys. And we're like, oh, absolutely. We should be having toy swap shelves and all of our states and all of our you know places across all our boroughs around the country not only does it you know help bridge the social divide because we're sharing more but you know it saves carbon it saves plastic it saves the embedded energy um habib any final words that must be 15 minutes i guess uh yeah just to say just to summarize i guess the three things i would say that um we have done to go beyond to to embrace um beyond, uh, beyond these aspects is we build relationships with other people um kind of finding those shared values even if the activities are different or the issues are different that's one the second is valuing people's contributions um so it's not all about our agenda and we want to um put in uh kind of it's all about us about transition it's actually really valuing what it is other people's agendas are and their contribution and then the third one is i guess seeing and valuing the interdependence and the kind of the entanglement of um all the issues whether it's um uh, uh, kind of political participation, whether it's economy, um, whether it's sort of social issues, they're all entangled uh, and they're all interdependent if we really are going to really see um, climate justice. And I'd just like to finally say, please get in touch with us. We're happy to talk to you now. We're happy to talk to you whenever. You know, we urge you all to do your what if pop-ups, to do your own equivalent to the visioning wrap. We're, we're you know, here, we're dying to work with you on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. So the force there, really, I think. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for highlighting sort of uh, the importance of the grant work of, of doing community, as, as, as we say, you know, the, the importance of reaching out to people. And perhaps one of the, one of the um, most difficult things, and, but again, it sounds very, very simple. One of the most difficult things is just to listen, listen, go out and listen to people. What, what are people's um, biggest concerns? And once you listen to people, then we can sort of um, come together, you know, or try to add, re link the issues that we're concerned about and also other people are concerned about. Um, I, I shall now pass on to Catherine from, um, from Sustainable St. Albans. And um, Catherine, I think, is going to talk a lot about how we build solidarity across differences because um, Sustainable St. Albans have been very successful for, for a long period of time now, really, I think, in, in reaching out to different groups and um, working with different groups and bringing different groups together, really, almost as a hub for, for different groups um, in that area. So over to you, Catherine. You're on mute. Oh, dearie me. Beginner's <laughs> error. You'd think after 12 months I'd have learned to unmute by now. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for giving us space to tell you about this and thank you for that lovely introduction. So hopefully if I share my screen, has that appeared at your end, Nick? So uh, so my mine begins in pretty much exactly the same place as Debbie's, um, where we were. So back in 2015, um, this was a very standard meeting for us. Uh, we would get a great speaker, we would book a community room, we would market it and then 20 people would come and the 20 people were brilliant people. I mean, so committed and so interested and so passionate, but we'd get to the end and we'd go, but where are the other 100,000 people in our district? You know, we've got a population of 140,000, you, you rule out the children and then you think, well, why are there only 20 people coming to our meeting? Um, and we got a bit despairing, to be honest, a bit um, a bit bleak about it. You know, you start thinking, well, is it is it worth it? Is all the work worth it? Uh, then we 
had this kind of light bulb moment that I'm going to tell you about, which led over a course of five years to being in a very different place. Um, so this is a collage of photos from our market takeover event in 2019. Uh, and what you can see is each of these people are from a different group, a completely different group in our community. And this is only a little sample of the people that were there that day. We took over the whole of the centre of St Albans. Um, we reckon about 5,000 people came to our sustainable market event that day. And that was just one event. That was the biggest event in our sustainability festival that in total had about 150 events that year. And we think reached something like 14,000 people. So still only 10% of our district, but a very long way on. Um, so what happened in the five years in between that got us to this place? So our light bulb moment was, instead of asking people to come to our event, that what we would do is we would ask existing groups of all kinds all across the district to arrange their own events they register their events with us and we put them into a program and we marked it. And over time that has evolved into being our sustainability festival. And we invite basically any group in the district. So that can be a business, that can be a faith group, that can be a school, that can be a charity. It can be a book group that decides it's going to theme its book that week about environment. Um, we say to all of those groups, come up with an event put it in the dates of our festival and it has to be themed about the environment and then it's come one come all it's a it's a buffet uh, we don't curate the events so it's not that we say right we're only going to have one a day and it's going to be carefully curated it ends up being just a, a spectrum of things going on that suit all of those different groups uh, our role is about inspiring them and coordinating and making it happen. Uh, so it's a bit like if you change your mindset from thinking that you're inviting your friends for dinner and you need to plan the meal and you need to decide everything that's going to be eaten and you need to cook it all. Instead, thinking, right, I'm having a potluck supper. I'm saying to people, come, bring what you bring and it'll be wonderful. Uh, if you click through on this link, sorry, if I click through on this link, you can just see a gallery of our photographs from Sussfest 19, and it gives you a really good sense of how it goes. So this was the market takeover. This was that big single event in the middle of town. Uh, we had everything from, you know, plastic free shopping, the Woodland Trust, the XR march through town, carrying the funeral cortege. It was just an incredible day. But that's just that one day, the market takeover. Over the rest of the three weeks, what you've got is everything and everyone from local groups. So local art galleries having an art exhibition themed about um, recycling materials and the climate, loads of different bike rides, some which were, you know, let's get started events for people who aren't regular cyclists, some of which were like Cycle Chilterns, I think it was 50 miles. Uh, lots of nature themed events by different local nature groups. These was the tickets were gone in a second. They were so popular. Uh, this was up at the cathedral, learning about the trees in the cathedral precinct. Uh, oh, isn't this a lovely picture? I can't wait to get back to a time when children can climb in trees together that life again. Uh, lots of things themed about food. It's such a popular way. This was um, a vegetarian meal for a local elderly group in one part of town. This was bread making run by a church. Uh, we had cooking with leftovers, vegetarian meals. Oh, what else? Lots of, I mean, serious events as well. So I've, I've painted a picture of kind of that festival side of it, but we also have a lot of very serious talks about sustainable transport, about the climate emergency, about the ecological crisis. So some groups really take that serious side of it. Some, um, this was a, a pub quiz by the local Friends of the Earth. Lots of things on food growing, local allotments open and they let you do walkthroughs. Uh, lots of things to inspire um, cooking. The Hearts Asian Women's Association did a session which was about seeing their herb area where they grow different herbs. And then they talked about how they use them in the cooking. Uh, and then kids. So there are lots of events aimed at youth groups like uh, lit picks and making things out of recycled materials and then lots of schools get involved as well and those events aren't for the general public they're for the school itself but it reaches hundreds of children then and and all of those school families right so that kind of paints the picture of the festival um, it's evolved over time 
the very first one was in 2015. We came up with the idea because we knew that the COP climate talks were happening in Paris that November. And we said, look, we can't influence Paris, but what if we did something locally the week before, we'll say it's Sustainable St Albans Week. That year, the first year, it was only a week long. We didn't know if we'd have five events or 15, or I think we put in our funding application, we hoped to have 30 events and we ended up with 80. Anyway, so we picked this week, the week before COP, and we started writing out to people and going, it's going to be Sustainable St Albans Week. Do you want to be part of it? And so we started with the usual suspects and we wrote to them. And then when they said yes, we started broadening out. So then we went to like a second circle of groups who we thought would be a little bit less likely. And we said, we've already got these groups signed up. Would you like to be part of Sustainable St Albans Week? And they started saying yes. And then we started reaching out kind of beyond that to the next circle and going, all of these groups are involved. Do you want to take part? And by the end, by it got to the autumn, we had some groups contact us and say, we're very disappointed you didn't include us in your festival. And we're thinking, well, it was open to everyone and we didn't even know you'd be interested. Um, so it happened the first time in the November. It went really well. We did it again the next year um, in the. Uh, uh, sorry, I've just realized there are people waiting in the waiting room and I've been given host privileges, so I better let them in. Right. Um, we did it again in 2016. Again, we did it in November. When we did a full evaluation after the 2016 week, we one of the things we got a lot of feedback was was could you move it to better weather because if you run it in november you're trying to get people to walk you're trying to get them to cycle you're trying to get them to grow it's just not the right time of year so then we took a bit of a longer break and the next one we did was in 2018 again sustainable St. Albans week when we did another review after that each time we were, we were being asked could you make it longer could you make it longer and we had resisted at first because the just the toll on us really it's a lot of work and then we went, all right, OK, we'll make it longer. So then in 2019, our sustainability festival, we then made it and then it was three weeks long. Uh, I've got the link here to the programme for the 2019 festival. And so each of these is, is a day. So this was Sunday, the 12th of May. Each of these is an entry of a different event that's happening. I've put the link to this in the chat so you can look at it later. But just to get a sense. So the, here is the overview. Each of these lines is an event. And our overview took four pages this time uh, because there were so many things going on. And this is to give you a sense, these are all the funders. So running alongside this was a big fundraising effort to find enough money to be able to coordinate and do the graphic design and do the printing for the festival. So I've put that link in the chat and you can find it later and have a good look at it. Then 2020, that's the heartbreak year. This is the one we had to cancel. Uh, we had over 200 events registered and we got to the point in February where we had, February, March, must have been March, where we had to decide, oh, are we going to start spending money on graphic designing and printing the program? And we had to take that decision. No, we can't do it. And that was a heartbreak. And I'm sure everyone on this session had to cancel events and activities. Uh, so how does it work in practice? So we are the hub in the wheel. What we do is we fundraise for and we do the project coordination. We design and run the registration process. So we have an online form that they fill in. We do the graphic design for the leaflets that go out early in the year, telling people it's going to happen for the program, for the banners. And then our role is marketing, 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 marketing. We, uh, we have a partner with the Hearts Ad, which is our local paper. We get bits on Radio Verulam. We uh, have banner sites around town that we arrange with the council. The council has really helpfully the last three years allowed us to put a flyer in when they send out their council tax mailing that goes to every household. They put our flyer in with it as well. So that gets to every household for very low cost. We run a handful of events like that big market takeover so that smaller groups can join in with some bigger events that we run. And then everything else is down to the groups. So they plan, arrange, register and market their own events. And really importantly, they're responsible for their own insurance, their own health and safety. So their events are theirs. We're not in charge of them. What we're doing is putting them in the programme and telling people about it. Reaching out is a really conscious effort. We have tried 
every year when we've run it, we've consciously said, what are all the different demographics within our district and how are we going to try and reach them? And that is geographically, it's by age, it's by politics, it's by income. We have a Bangladeshi community in St Albans that we've tried very deliberately to try and build bridges with. Uh, we have not always succeeded and it's been slow progress, but we make it a conscious effort. So for example, with faith groups, we have one of our volunteers on our organizing group who takes that on. And she has walked around, I think, every church, every mosque and the synagogues in our district and delivered them information telling them that the festival was happening and asking them to take part. Uh, we've reached out to the Citizens Advice Bureau and they've run events on fuel poverty. We make sure we reach to every political party and tell them that it's happening so that they can take part if they want to. They don't all choose to, but they are all invited. Uh, we have written to every school and asked them to take part. And then gradually that becomes easier because at first you're just going to the admin at email address. But over time, we've started to have contact teachers. And arts and music is really important as well. It reaches into a completely different way if you get bands and art galleries and the, the Ver Poets Society did a whole poetry competition and they, they ran it and got beautiful poetry coming out of it. Uh, it really helps to make sure you're reaching out to people through the things that they love. So outdoor activities, food, nature, really catch people who would never turn up to a vegan dinner or a lecture on sustainable transport. Oh, I thought I'd taken that off that slide. Uh, fundraising. So just to touch on this, fundraising really important. I can't tell you how important it is. There's so much that you can get done with volunteers, but then beyond that, to have the additional time to run something on this scale takes, we have found, paid part-time people. Uh, our budget is around £25,000 a year. But remember, that was for a three week festival with a printed program, graphic design, and everything. Yours could be bigger, yours could be smaller. And the main thing that goes off on is paying some hours for a part time coordinator. For the, um, we have a comms freelance worker who does social media, website, and then it's design and printing the program. And we have a whole mixture of funding. The biggest thing is we've managed to secure uh, lottery awards for all grants each year, other local grants, business sponsorship sponsorship and adverts in the program. We didn't manage to get any in the first year because we had nothing to show that we could actually deliver this. But from year two onwards, we've started getting people advertising in the program. And then we do crowdfunding each year and we get some donations each year. And it's a whole uh, mixture trying to get all that, that money in together to be sure that we can run it each year. 2021, we're having to do things a little bit differently. Of course, we've got COVID. So what we're doing is in all of our commons this year, we're focusing on running a COVID safe SASFest 21. And that means it's going to be a whole mixture of outdoor events in small groups and um, online events and also kind of flexible events that can be adjusted at the last minute. So it might be planned as either a Zoom event or we've got a small hall booked. Uh, so that's what we're saying to groups is come up with things that work in a COVID world, but then be ready if we've got a bit more freedom to flex them if we can. Where to start if you're listening to this and think that sounds exciting and something you want to do. Uh, for, uh, do not do this alone. Um, you need to find a small group. So one of the first things that we did in what was then Transition St Albans is now Sustainable St Albans. One of the first things we did was we reached out to St Albans Friends of the Earth and said, will you do this with us? And between the two groups that we then had enough people to get an organizing group going. And then over time, people have got excited and they've joined that group. So the first year, there were probably six or seven of us. Now, I think there's about 15. Uh, choose a date that's good, that works for you. One obvious link would be to do it in November in the run up to COP26. Although, as I said, we started doing that in, in uh, five years ago and then we ended up moving it to the spring because it's such better weather but that doesn't you might this year you might want that link to cop if what i've just said sounds a bit overwhelming start with one day just try and do a one day festival and learn from that uh, where i would start is is grab a piece of paper that sat next to you and write down the 10 groups you know in your area who are most likely to be up for this and start with those 10 but then when they've said yes broaden that circle who are the next 10 groups to write to after that and then broaden it again 
who are the ones who will get involved when they see there's a momentum gathering. And meantime, start the fundraising. Don't, don't wait to make the festival start going until you have the money. Do them in parallel, but don't start committing money until you know you've got it secured. It's, a, it's an awkward thing where you have to run those two things in parallel, otherwise you don't have time to make it all happen. And the other thing I would say is, is absolutely, if you're excited by what I've just said, but do it your way, don't do it our way. This works for us, it works in our district, but hang on to that light bulb moment that says, if you make it about the groups rather than about yourself and that you are supporting them in their environmental action and you're marketing what they're doing to your area, that's the light bulb moment to hang on to and then do it in the way that works for you. Wow, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, I've taken so many notes and I have so many questions and so on. Um, but uh, I think what we agreed before everyone came in was that we want, I mean, often when you go to, to these sessions, um, there isn't enough time for, for question and answer with, with the audience, but we would like to broaden this out, make this quite an open conversation. So um, and on that note, I invite you, there are lots of questions in the chat. I would encourage you, uh, whoever's posted those questions, just um, perhaps raise your hand, your electronic hand or, or your um, physical hand and um, ask your question to, to whoever you want to um, direct it at. So who's, uh, Dan, can you see the hands? Okay, let me start. Um, uh, let me pick, I'll just pick up one question. I think um, Transition Bollington had a couple of questions. Can I encourage you to perhaps Transition Bollington ask those questions? Hi, thank you, Nick. It's, it's Helen here. Hi, Helen. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in uh, in how the speakers feel um, their the mindset in their respective communities facilitated the take up uh, of their ideas. Obviously, all communities are different. Um, you know, there's a different feeling in each community. I just I just wonder, if, you know, how that played out for them. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, who wants to start? Have you? Yeah, no, I'll just say that. I okay. think Helen yeah. and I completely started from exactly the same place. We realised we had to reach beyond our transition, or whatever it was called, group. And it was the coming together of all the different groups in the area, Friends of the Earth, XR, those are just the green groups. But there's other groups. I mean, you know, just reach out to different groups and form one big happy ecosystem of a family that's how you do it. You go to other groups and it's not, it's also groups that are not just green groups. Find other groups that are looking for social change. Mm -hmm. I think that's a key point. Find um, groups that are not just green groups. And that is how I think we make, we, we build community, so to speak. Um, yeah, Catherine, response to that question. I think it helped us that our district already had quite a few environmental groups or environmentalish groups so that at that beginning we did have it wasn't just us there were other groups we could reach out to and say let's make this happen I think that really helped but also I think what doing this for five years has done is actually change our district I think that's a bit of a bold claim but I just see so much more environment. Look, we're one part of this. I've seen so much more environmental action across our district in the last couple of years, of which I think we're one bit. Um, and certainly, if I think back to the first year, standing in town at the market, trying to give out programs for Sustainable St Albans Week, and people were like, what's that? And then by about year three, they were coming up to us and going, oh, good, is this the program? Like it had become something they were looking forward to and they wanted to be part of. And when we evaluate, every, each time we've run it, we've done a really proper evaluation. And one of the things that comes out most strongly is people love feeling part of something positive in their district that's wider than them, mm -hmm. especially the schools. The schools mm -hmm. love that their school is one part of something that's district wide. So you can change your you can change that ethos over time by doing something like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Hannah. Yes, yes, Donald, I, I just saw you. Go for it. Hi, um, I live in the Scottish borders and um, our population is a bit more dilute than, 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 than what you've been talking about. So our, our towns are 2,000 people, 3,000 people, 4,000 people, that sort of thing. So there's obviously kind of a dilution factor there, not so many groups, not so many people in the groups, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, I just want to kind of make that point because I'm very excited about this and I, I think it could be adapted to a more rural situation as well. But my question was, was really about um, keeping control, keeping it a green festival. Uh, I hear what you're saying about reaching out to other community groups that aren't green, you know, they're, they're dealing with social issues and health issues and poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, how do you kind of keep the sort of essence of the festival on the climate and ecological emergency and not get it diluted amongst all the other equally important or not equally, but you know, very important issues which are also in the community. So there's two bits of that, one of which is we don't, we don't define it as narrowly as you've just described. So we use the bioregional 10 themes framework. I don't know if you all know it. Bioregional has this great framework for one planet living which has 10 different themes and they include culture and community, they include health and happiness. So it's a very broad definition of environmental sustainability. So, and then we match each of the events in the program against which theme it's relevant to. Uh, so that's one thing is I think we don't, we're not just focusing on the climate and ecological adversity, we're, um, we're focusing it slightly more broadly with the bioregional 10 theme. But the other thing is if people apply to us and they register an event that doesn't fit within the themes, then we say no to it. But that's only happened a handful of times in the, in the time that we've run it. Um, and generally they're really well-meaning events. They're just not environmental. And then we'll go back to them and go, look, we're, we're sorry. We've never had anyone kind of try and take the mick and, and, and register an event with us that really has nothing to do with the environment. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yes, yes, um, Debbie. Sorry, can I also just add to that? In term, it's very interesting to how to classify what is environmental action. I mean, we would say helping develop a sharing economy is a really important part of environmental action. Um, so, for example, if we do pop-ups and things like that. You know, how can we use food that's fade, that's waste food that would, you know, would have gone to? Can we offer free tea? It's all. It's about sharing things. That's what we're trying to do. Um, I still consider that real environmental action, but it's not classic green, you know, stuff. I know it's different to a festival to pop-ups. Sorry. Thank you very much, um, Debbie. Um, Lynn, you have a question. Yeah, so it's what you just mentioned, saying about the 10 themes. Um, can you put that in the chat or uh, give us a link to, to it? Because um, I've never heard of it. Sorry. That's it, the bioregional. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lynn. And um, I think Wendy, Wendy Nalti also had a question, a couple of questions, if I remember correctly, scrolling through the chats. Wendy, are you still with us? Yeah, I am. I was, I think they've been answered about the capacity and how on earth you managed to do it all, but it's great to see. It, I asked a question before you slide about funding. So kind of when I saw that you actually do require a part-time coordinator, it made it seem a little bit more achievable. But um, yeah, that just to say, I thought it was fantastic. It's really inspirational. It's great to see somewhere doing it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, Nick. Yes, thanks, Wendy. Um, Susie Jenner, Susie from Waltham Cell. Hi, Susie. Hello. Hi. Um, hi. Um, thanks, it's been really, yeah, inspiring. Um, it sounds like um, certainly in Camden, um, you've got a good relationship with the council um, and um, I, I, I don't know how that's worked in St Albans as well. So it's kind of a question for, for both of you. Um, but I just wonder whether you've got any tips on sort of um, how to go about um, making that relationship, um, kind of starting it. We, I don't, you know, the experience that, uh, that some of the groups that I know here have had in Wilton Forest um, have been less positive. Um, so just, yeah, Wendy, if you've got, if you've got any tips for uh, approaching the council and how to get them on side. Um, you want to go first, Debbie? Yeah, I actually just say we're going to be running a session on the 20th of March, the last day of the, the, this dance forward thing about it's going to be an hour and a half session about how to get in with your councils. We can really explore it then. We've just worked really hard 
with them, you know, breaking them down. What's it? The way to start with your council is get a, a map, look at your council and try and work out what departments are where, you know, there's green spaces, transport, housing, engagement, just sort of understand your council. I mean, obviously sustainability is the obvious department to go for, but we're now of the mindset that actually a really good functioning council shouldn't have a sustainability department. Sustainability should be embedded in every job person's description across the council, but that's the dream. Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely. Uh, just want to echo that a really um, good functioning council shouldn't have a sustainability department. How challenging is that? You know, it's, oh, wow, thank you. Um, Catherine? We're in a very different place now than we were five years ago. So five years ago, I think they would have seen us as a sort of small, small pressurish group. Um, but over time, as we've delivered things that the council sees as really valuable, reaching out to the community in, and engaging the community in a way that they want to do but find difficult, they now see us as a very valuable partner. Mm. And so in Susfest 2019, we ran alongside it a climate emergency petition. And every event that we ran, we asked if we asked the organizers if they were happy for us to ask for signatures on the climate emergency petition we got 1500 signatures that triggered a debate for council and um, council passed unanimously a climate emergency declaration set up a climate advisory working group and invited us and St Albans Friends of the Earth to be part of that so we're in a very different place now but that has taken time that's taken work that's that's taken working with them on projects that they see us delivering so they start to think okay you're a group that to take more seriously and engage with. Oh, and being very, we've had to be very careful about, which I think is a real tension for any transition group. We've had to be very careful about making sure that we remain non-political. Yeah. Uh, we've had changes in leadership in, in the time that we've yeah. been working locally. And we're always really clear that we focus on practical local action, things that people can do to live more sustainably. Mm. There is also, I want to put a tough love comment in here. We also get accused, get accused of, I think, and do work of being greenwash, you know, to the council roll us out and there's a collaboration and a co design and a co this and a co that. But, you know, is it greenwash? Are we stopping them doing the really important infrastructure work they need to be doing? So I'm aware of that. Some of the people accuse us of uh, taking, you know, issue away from the big issues. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, just want to touch on something Kat Catherine said, and she said it a couple of times, you know, once during the talk as well, that we have to appreciate this as, yes, we face an emergency. Yes, we face a crisis. But this is also a marathon that we're involved in, you know, within, within our localities. This takes time. Relationships take time to build. Relationships with other people within the community take time to build. Relationships with the council take time to build. But, you know, you can't, we can't do this. You know, if we get enough people on board, we can put some pressure. Um, I, can I invite um, Marta, Marta to um, ask her question, please? Are you still with us, Marta? Yes, yeah, still here. Um, thank you, everybody, for your great presentations. Um, I actually wanted to pick up on something that you said, Nick, after one of the presentations, which is about listening to the mm. groups that maybe we don't have that relationship with. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know how people do that. I think the only thing that I, I sort of come up with is going to the events run by other groups that I maybe don't know that well. But um, yeah, if people have practical tips on sort of how to do the listening before you sort of jump in with your vision of what you want those groups to do, would be really great to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Um, shall we start with you, Catherine? It, there's no quick answer to that, is there? It, it is about reaching out to those groups. Yeah, if, if possible, going along to one of their meetings, understanding what their priorities are, engaging with them on their terms. Um, I'm thinking at the moment, so um, we've been really grateful to uh, the Bounce Forward grants. We've got some funding to do some innovative things this time around in the festival and one of those is we're working with the Bangladeshi community to co-create an event about um, flooding in Bangladesh and then what people can do to live sustainably and making that connection between our district and them and that is very much trying to find ways to listen to that community and understand 
what event would work, which is meaningful to them. Um, but yeah, there, there is no, there's no quick way to do that. It just requires time and thought and effort and prioritization, which is, I wish I had a more magic answer. Thank you. Debbie? Oh, oh sorry, Habiba, sorry, 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 go for it, sorry. Oh. I was just going to add, I think, um, so one of the things I remember Debbie and I did with our local um, city farm is when he, they, then they had a new director and we went to see him and we were like, what matters to you? We just asked him what matters to you and how can we work together? And he just, he told us what he wanted um, and we just, we just did that. And that first thing is then um, he's like, oh, you've listened, you've listened, you've heard what I, what, what I wanted. And that first thing just led us to build that relationship. So now we have a very different relationship with our city farm. And that was about two or three years ago. So again, it's just really, um, as, as Catherine said, there's no magic bullet to it, but it's just really, really hearing people and not imposing our own um, agendas, but being very open to people's agendas. Mm -hmm. One, wonderful, Actually, wonderful. that's it. That, that reminds me of an example that links back to the previous question as well about the council. Is in an early meeting we had with the council, one of the things they were talking about was that they were really, really trying to deal with recycling and waste at the big council events, but how difficult it was because you've got all those people in the town centre and they're chucking things in the wrong bins. And one of the things we then did was we arranged for volunteers to, I know this sounds kind of dull, but we arranged for volunteers to man the bins at the big city centre events that the council runs. Uh, you know, we gave them high visits, the council lent us the litter picks and everything. And then we just stood there going, oh, that goes in that bin, that goes in that bin. And the council saw that as a really, really helpful thing we were doing. It cost us nothing because it was just volunteer effort. And it really established that they saw that we were trying to help them solve a problem that they had. Mm -hmm.